While they're serving dessert, I think that we will go ahead and get started with our evening program. To introduce our evening lecture tonight is Diane Marie Amen. Professor Amen is currently the Emily and Ernest Woodruff Chair in International Law at the University of Georgia School of Law and is an expert in the inter interaction of national, regional, and international regimes in effort to combat atrocity, atrocity and cross-border crime. And she is also the founder of the International Law Girls Blog. And so, with that, please welcome <laughs> Professor Anand. Thank you so much, Jim. And, um, Thank you on behalf of the now nearly 300 women and one man, that would be Ban Ki-moon, who have contributed posts to In Law Girls blog. Um, the reason that I, there are perhaps two reasons that I am introducing our speaker tonight. The first is that this is the In Law Girls event. We are a co-sponsor of this event. We have no money. But we do try to uh, deliver some sweat equity and some publicity about the dialogues in exchange for the honor of co-sponsoring. Um, and the, uh, in that capacity, having launched this particular event last year, David Crane uh, was kind enough to ask me to be the inaugural lecturer. So I'm also wearing the hat of the successor uh, or the predecessor, and I am sure that next year we will ask Layla to take this role since she will be in the predecessor role. I welcome you all to look at It Law Girls blog. If you look at it today, if you Google it, you will find that there is a photograph of uh, Prosecutor Fosu Ben Suda laying the brick at the Jackson Center yesterday with some comments about what happened yesterday, and we welcome you to do that. One of the things that we do at Law Girls is that we honor foremothers. One of our foremothers is Clara Barton, and so we were just delighted to see that she also now has a lecture at this event named after her. I'll tell you about one of her, our other co-authors, or foremothers, in a moment, but let me um, switch a hat really quickly and tell you that um, I am also very active in the American Society of International Law, which is another co-sponsor of the dialogues. Um, ASIL will play a leading role tomorrow when Betsy Anderson, the executive director who is here with us, uh, reads the declaration of the prosecutors for this event at Chautauqua. But I did want to let you know there is an ASIL table. Uh, Nino Garuli and Shannon Powers are staffing it. I welcome you to go talk to them. You will find there, among other things, the now famous essay by Donald Donovan that was the key uh, part of Hans Quarell's speech today when he was talking about the United States. You will find membership applications. You will also find um, information about the ASIL mid-year meeting, which I have the honor of serving as co-chair for this mid-year meeting. It will be October 19th to 21st in Atlanta and Athens, Georgia. There will be uh, a day practice oriented on the Friday at Coca-Cola headquarters, and then we will move to the University of Georgia uh, for two days of scholarly roundtables, uh, the board meeting of the ASL board, and a luncheon keynote by Patricia O'Brien, UN legal counsel, and a dinner keynote by Harold Coe. And so uh, please pick up one of these flyers and we would love to see you there. Um, the last thing that I want to flog, and then I will go back to my original reason for being here, is uh, something else you will find at the ASIL table. These are the proceedings that are published every year uh, of these dialogues. There are now five, and so ASIL has um, conveniently created this lovely boxed set. <laughs> and uh, as David Crane said yesterday, you could teach a course in international criminal law with this. And so we welcome you to take a look at these at the table. They're, they are for sale, and um, I'm sure that Shannon and Nino would like to not have to bring any of them back to Washington, so please help them out with that. Um, one of the things that Int Law Girls has done in addition to uh, sponsoring this is I, I do want to mention that a number of our 
contributors have been speakers at this event or are present, and I want to honor them. One of them is Beth von Skock, who is uh, a frequent blogger until Steve Rapp stole her and made her his deputy at the U.S. Department of State Office of Global Justice. Jennifer Trahan, Trahan, I'm sorry, I forgot to ask first, who is at NYU, is here, and she works uh, tirelessly uh, as a member of civil society in the U.S. on behalf of the ICC. Valerie Oosterveld, I believe, is here, or maybe her children have dragged her off for the bedtime story. Um, she is a professor at the University of Western Ontario Law School, and you will meet her tomorrow when she delivers the year in review uh, event. Prosecutor Fatu Mansuda also has contributed. She kindly, in December, contributed the speech that she delivered to the Assembly of States parties uh, upon the event of her election to the position that she now holds as an inaugural post. The last contributor I would like to mention is Leila Nadia Sadat. She is our guest speaker today, and she will be delivering the, the Catherine B. Fight Lecture. Um, this is a lecture uh, to which we owe much to John Q. Barrett, who three years ago, in um, a speech you can find in your box set, <laughs> uh, delivered a talk uh, about Catherine B. Fight. She was uh, one of the few women involved very deeply in the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. She was a lawyer for the U.S. Department of State who had also been to the San Francisco Conference of the UN, to the Yalta Conference, and elsewhere. Um, and she helped draft the London Charter. She was essentially uh, Robert Jackson's right hand and his international law expert. And so I commend to you uh, John's talk about her and um, as well in the Blue Book, when I gave this lecture last year, which I called from politics to pro or, excuse me, politics and prosecution, from Catherine Fight to Fatu Ben Souda, uh, I also talked a little bit about her biographically. She's a great inspiration to all of us who care about international criminal law, as is Leila Sadat, who is uh, the Henry Overshelp Professor at Washington University in St. Louis and the director of the Whitney Harris World Law Institute. We're honored to have uh, Mr. Harris's uh, wife, Anna, here today. They, the institute has been a very uh, long time and avid supporter of the dialogues. Layla truly has a bio that is far too long to read at this hour, so I will not do it. And uh, I know many of you know her already and know that she's a wonderful uh, scholar, a wonderful and very um, careful scholar and speaker. And I look forward, as I'm sure you do, to hear her talk about what promises to be, by its title, a very pr provocative lecture entitled Drone Wars and the Nuremberg Legacy. Without further ado, let's welcome Leila Sadat. It's wonderful to be here, and it, I would have worn pink if I thought about the in-law girls connection, because uh, next year, next year. Um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, dear colleagues, dear Chautauquans, dear students. This lecture is dedicated to the memory of the women of Nuremberg and to dialogue about war and the limits on war provided by international humanitarian law. It's also a lecture taking place on the banks of Lake Chautauqua in a hotel known as the Athenaeum. And the Athenaeum in ancient Greece was actually a temple dedicated to the goddess Athena and a gathering place where persons who were learned could meet and talk. In our times, it is sometimes used to refer to associations of persons dedicated to education and humanistic causes. I would therefore like to begin my talk 
not with incisive and provocative legal analysis, hopefully some of that will come later, uh, nor with the usual thanks, which will certainly come later, but with a story, a story of the Greek goddess Athena, herself a great warrior, but also known for her thoughtful use of strategy and wisdom in the conduct of war. In one famous myth, Athena and Poseidon, the god of the sea, struggled to win the hearts of an ancient Greek city. Poseidon sent the people of the city a very impressive gift. He gave them a gift of a river, which he created by plunging his trident into the soil. And when he plunged his trident into the ground, unfortunately, although the river he created looked good, the river was salt water, which was not very useful for the people living there as they could neither drink it nor use it to water their crops. According to legend, Athena then stepped forward and she struck her spear into the ground. She then planted an olive tree in the hole that was created and the olive tree grew and gave food, shelter, and firewood to the people. The people loved her and they asked her to be the patron of their city, which of course was named Athens. Now there is a postscript to the story. Poseidon was furious at the people of Athens and being warlike and genuinely, generally bad tempered, uh, he cursed Athens for asking Athena to be its patron saint. And in order to appease him, the Athenians denied women the right to vote. So the triumph of the female sex was extremely short lived. Uh, <laughs> I tell this story um, because I'd like to use it to actually frame some of the issues that now I have to put on my glasses because it gets tricky uh, in today's Catherine Fight lecture at this six international humanitarian law dialogues. I'm honored both because I've been asked to represent the female voice, la voix féminine, at this uh, conversation that we have together each year. And I'm honored and humbled because I've also been asked to address such an illustrious group. And I might add, I'm a little nervous as well. Um, I recount the story as well to make the point that our left brain understanding of law and logic cannot always answer the question about what is the right thing to do. Just because something may be lawful, it may nonetheless be immoral or foolish. As Jill Bolte-Taylor, some of you may have heard of her, the famous neuroscientist, reminds us in her astonishing story of what life was like when she literally lost her left brain function to a stroke. We need our right as well as our left brains, our wisdom as well as our strength, the female as well as the male voice, the yin as well as the yang to make good decisions. Last year, Diane Amon treated us to a superb lecture surveying Catherine Fight's work at Nuremberg, as well as the relationship between politics and prosecutors. The year before, we experienced an extraordinary lecture on Cecilia Goetz, uh, who had actually delivered an opening statement at Nuremberg. And rather than continuing to revisit the work of these trailblazing and extraordinary women who have preceded me, I decided to choose the application of the Nuremberg principles and the Nuremberg precedent that they helped establish to a modern problem in international humanitarian law, taking up the question of the use of drones, lethal operations conducted with the use of unmanned aerial vehicles in the conduct of the US war on terror. And I have to thank Ambassador Carell for raising the issue this morning. I chose the topic because of its legal, moral, and policy implications for the US and international humanitarian law, what I'll refer to as IHL, in my talk, and it's a connection to the important work accomplished by the international criminal tribunals and courts, which are the subject of the dialogues. Steeped as we are here in the living legacy of Nuremberg at this conference, the subject also seems extremely appropriate, as the American use of targeted killing in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, Libya, Iraq, and Somalia, popularly sometimes viewed in the press as the drone wars, raises the question of the application of the Nuremberg Principles to the conduct of America's longest running war. 
It also seemed particularly fitting to raise this controversial subject here in a location known for its commitment to civil conversation and thoughtful reflection, and at a conference um, focused upon creating a dialogue amongst those committed to the enforcement of international humanitarian law. As I'll endeavor to explain and have alluded to already to choose wisely about the use of these weapons, I do think decision makers in the United States may have to engage much more deeply with the question whether the use of targeted killing with drones is not only legal, but is a policy that resonates with our deepest values and understanding of who we are to make decisions that promote long-term interests and international peace and justice. I certainly do not pretend to have all the answers in this regard, but I'm extremely grateful to David Crane, the Jackson Center, the Chautauqua Institution, uh, my good friends Diane Amen and Beth Von Scock and in Law Girls for the opportunity to raise some of the questions with you this evening. Some of you may be familiar with the writings of David Rohde, the New York Times reporter who was captured by the Taliban in November 2008 and held along with two Afghan colleagues for several months in North and South Waziristan, the focus of the U.S. drone campaign at the time. Rohde was lu lucky enough to escape from his captors, and he penned a series of gripping articles about his captivity that appeared on the front pages of the Times in 2009. And if you haven't seen these pieces, I really recommend them. Extraordinary piece of journalism. David recounts an astonishing tale, both of his capture, the death threats he endured, the hardships he faced in, in his imprisonment. But what I found even more extraordinary in these writings was his insights into the mind of his Taliban captors. In particular, because he was being held in an area of intense U.S. drone activity, he wrote about the experience of being on the ground while U.S. drones circle overhead. He recently resummarized some of this in an article for Reuters magazine, and I quote, Throughout our captivity, he writes, American drones were a frequent presence in the skies above North and South Waziristan. Unmanned, propeller-driven aircraft, they sound like a small plane, a Piper Cub or a Cessna circling overhead. Dark specks in a blue sky, they could be spotted and tracked with the naked eye. Our guards studied their flight patterns for indications of when they may strike. The drones were terrifying, he adds. From the ground, it is impossible to determine who or what they are tracking as they circle overhead. The buzz of a distant propeller is a constant reminder of imminent death. Drones fire missiles that travel faster than the speed of sound. A drone's victim never hears the missile that kills him. Rhodey was almost beheaded by his captors after a drone strike took place near his prison because he was blamed for this, and the, he, he speaks of the deranged Taliban that were holding him. And he admits that the drone strikes clearly disrupted Taliban operations and were tactically effective in that respect. At the same time, he observes in his articles that they generated extraordinary hatred of the United States, inflicted fear on the civilian population there, and tended to increase, in his view, uh, support for the militants. Though only recently publicly acknowledged by U.S. government officials, attacks by drones have become a major part of U.S. military strategy and counterterrorism operations. I won't go into the technical details. They include the Predator drone and the Weeper drone. Um, according to U.S. Air Force um, material, they uh, can autonomously execute a kill chain, find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess high against high-value, fleeting, and time-sensitive targets. Besides a small on-site crew that handles the Predator's takeoff and landing, the Predator is controlled remotely by a crew based in the United States and can fire Hellfire missiles when that uh, individual uses its controls. In 2009, Jane Meyer wrote an article in The New Yorker reporting on a drone strike in Pakistan again and discussed both the CIA's highly classified program and um, the more open use of drones by the military in Afghanistan. The story gener generated a great deal of criticism, and just as lawyers were asked to justify Bush administration policies on detention after the 9-11 attacks, Obama administration lawyers have of course been asked to do the same for the drone program. 
in 2010, the legal advisor to the U.S. Department of State gave a very important and much anticipated speech to the annual meeting of the American Society of International Law in which he defended the Obama administration's increasing use of drones against individuals alleged to be members of al-Qaeda, the Taliban, or, quote, associated forces. The speech emphasized the desire of the United States to comply with IHL and specifically the principles of distinction and proportionality, and as a matter of law stated that the United States' right to kill was based upon the existence of an armed conflict between it and various individuals and organizations that gave a right to the United States to use self-defense against those individuals and organizations. The speech was obviously controversial, Although um, Obama had promised during the presidential campaign to pursue terrorists and finish the war in Afghanistan, um, I think human rights activists, at least some, did not expect his administration to cleave to the same legal arguments about the war on terror that his predecessor had and were surprised that he had done so. Dean Coe's speech re responded to very few of the difficult legal and moral questions raised by targeted killing with the use of drones and although he never uses the Bush administration term unlawful enemy combatant to describe those targeted, the speech seemed more in line with past administration policies than a departure from them. Subsequently, the drone campaign intensified and additional drone strikes took place in more countries and occasionally against not only foreigners, but United States citizens. Because the program has been operated by the CIA and was largely secret, Quantitative assessments of the number of strikes, the location of the strikes, the number of persons killed, and the identities of those killed or injured is very difficult to come by. Based upon what information is available in the public record, it has been estimated that during his eight years in office, President Bush authorized approximately 44 strikes in Pakistan. Conversely, in less than four years, it has been reported that President Obama authorized 294 strikes in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. In Pakistan alone, again, casualty figures are all over the map. There tends to be general agreement on overall number, but a great deal of dispute about what percentage are or are not civilians. Um, those reported in Pakistan are estimated between 2,500 to 3,500 individuals killed, with another 1,200 to 1,300 injured. Civilian percentages of that range from 30 to 800 to 1,000, depending on whom you listen to. In 2011, a memorandum drafted by the Office of Legal Counsel uh, authorized it, apparently, because it was leaked to the press, the targeted killing of a U.S. citizen, a fellow named Alaki, in Yemen. This memo is not public. However, its contents were described by anonymous sources um, to journalist Charlie Savage and others and published in the New York Times. According to the public record, the memo authorized the killing of Awalaki only if it was not feasible to capture him. The killing was justified because he was taking part in the war between the United States and Al-Qaeda and posed a significant threat to Americans. That's a quote from the article. The memorandum argued that killing him was not an assassination, he was a lawful target in an armed conflict, and killing was not murder, therefore, of one American citizen by another. It also concluded that the drone pilot, a CIA official who was not in uniform, would not be committing a war crime, and relying on precedent uh, with respect to the use of the right of uh, American citizens to be tried in military courts, the memorandum also apparently states that the process due to him was not constitutional Fifth Amendment due process, but something called due process in war, and concluded that his killing was legal. There have been some interesting litigation. His, um, there was a lawsuit that was dismissed to try to stop it. Eventually, he was actually killed. So subsequently, another prominent government lawyer, Attorney General Eric Holder, went public to justify the targeted killing of foreigners and U.S. citizens by the government with no judicial process or congressional check. Holder's speech laid out the procedures this time used by the president to determine who to target for capture, who to target with legal force, and who to try before military commissions rather than civilian courts. Reading the speech, to my mind, and others have made the same comment, it seems clear, if it hadn't been before, that the precedent set and the tactics employed by the Bush administration have not been rejected by the current administration, but are part and parcel of U.S. policy. 
the fundamental conceptual error, in my view, of the Bush administration's legal regime that the targets of the U.S. war on terror are entitled to neither the protection of the criminal law or human rights law, nor the protection of international humanitarian law, but exist instead in a legal black hole um, subject to the whim or the grace of the executive remains virtually unchanged. Although generally avoiding the term unlawful enemy combatant, this administration appears in fact to be using either an identical legal analysis or an analysis that leads to the same conclusion. Finally, it's worth mentioning on April 30th uh, of this year, right after a particularly controversial drone strike in Pakistan, John Brennan, assistant to the President for Homeland Security, gave a spirited defense of our targeted killing policy at the Woodrow Wilson Center at Princeton. Brennan is not a lawyer. He asserted that the United States government conducts targeted strikes against specific al-Qaeda terrorists, quote, to prevent terrorist attacks on the United States and save American lives. He argued the strikes were legal, effective, and ethical. And notice that we, meaning the administration, employ standards and processes designed to ensure targeting is legal and is effective. The speech obviously did not quell the international criticism of the U.S. drone program, nor satisfy Pakistani objections to its conduct. This is not surprising because uh, other than Israel perhaps, and the targeted killing program is different there, the U.S. is really the only country in the world to aggressively use targeted killing as a counterterrorism strategy, although it's not the only country to use it at all. Two UN special rapporteurs have criticized the US program, Philip Alston and subsequently Christoph Heinz, and uh, ICRC president Jakob Kellenberger has worried aloud it may be undermining fundamental principles of international humanitarian law. In spite of the fact that some of America's top legal talent and individuals that I enormously respect, I should add, and admire, have penned uh, legal opinions and given speeches justifying the use of targeted killing by the United States, I remain unconvinced that the targeting killing memos and explanations have answered all the questions surrounding the use of this controversial new weapon of war. And note there are two issues. One is the question of the weapon itself. The other is the question of how the weapon is used. And I'll come back to that in a moment. And it might be legal to use the weapon, but the weapon might still raise ethical or moral issues. Perhaps in response to the fury generated by the torture memos, which were either released or leaked to the press and then subjected to intense analysis and debate by other lawyers, the lawyering up, I call it, of targeted killing by the Obama administration has largely remained rather vague, policy-driven, and secret. The speeches on record are imprecise as to which targets are permissible, where attacks may take place and under what conditions, whether or not specific congressional authorization exists or is needed for the attacks, who is entitled to carry out the operations, the military or the CIA, and the expected purpose of the killings. They rest upon assumptions about the law of war that have been challenged in many, by many preeminent authorities including the assumption that the United States is entitled to attack non-state actors under Article 51 of the Charter as a response to terror activity, that the ensuing war follows the terrorists wherever they may be found, and that the war has no temporal limitation. Some have suggested that perhaps uh, the administration has resorted to killing terror suspects to avoid the tricky legal problems surrounding indefinite detention and trial. I do not know if this is true. Yet the picture emerging does suggest that the administration has implicitly reversed the normal rules and burdens of proof that accompany the use of legal force by the state, obliging those targeted to prove their innocence or their status as civilians, and adopting a presumption of guilt rather than innocence for terror suspects. As Claire Finkelstein has observed, our current approach to ki targeted killing, she writes, is betwixt and between. We treat targeted individuals as belligerents insofar as we regard them as legitimate targets by virtue of status rather than action. But we treat them as subjects of law enforcement in that we resist according them the privileges that go along with combatant status, such as affording them the rights of POWs or recognizing their equal right to kill in combat. In my time remaining, I'd just like to briefly raise four sets of legal questions, and again, I think they're more questions than answers, uh, regarding U.S. Uh, targeted killing with drone operations. The first is what is the legal regime governing the use of force? The second is who are the permissible targets? 
The third, what processes are used to create the kill list? And fourth, what are the intended purpose of the strikes? And I'll just go through a few of these rather briefly. The authorization for the use of military force resolution, or the AUMF, that was adopted by Congress in the wake of the 9-11 attacks and that authorized the military invasion of uh, Afghanistan by coalition forces states that the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against, and I quote, all nations, organizations, or persons he determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terror attacks that occurred on September 11th or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future acts of international terrorism against the United States by those nations, organizations, or persons. The resolution seems to limit the targets of America's war on terror to those having a nexus to the 9-11 attacks, but it was not on its face suggest that individuals having nothing to do with those attacks could still fall within the armed conflict authorized in 2001. Indeed, and I can't believe I'm quoting Mitt Romney, but conservative, conservatives have now started to raise questions about whether we don't need congressional debate and reauthorization of the drone war. The government's current position I've already stated, uh, and it's basically a self-defense argument. And the self-defense argument allows the government to kill individuals alleged to be enemies of the United States, even if they're found on the territories of state with which the United States is not at war. Now, even assuming that individuals in question are combatants that can be targeted with the use of military force, an assumption that at least some have questioned, um, the fact that most of the drone strikes are taking place in states at peace with the United States suggests not only that the use of military force against individuals in those states may be ill-advised, but may in some circumstances be unlawful. Although the United States continues to maintain that there are no geographical constraints to the war on terror, which follows the suspected individuals wherever they may be, I'm not sure that position is generally accepted as a rule of international law. Philip Alston has made this point several times, as has Mary Ellen O'Connell. And again, going back to this issue of ad infinitum, it's not clear when we look at Resolution 1373 adopted in 2001 that there continues to be an ongoing right with no temporal limitations whatsoever. Who can be targeted? The rhetoric used in describing the targeting of individuals placed on the kill list is imprecise. The individuals in question are alternatively described, and again, this is the media describing it or memos that have been leaked, so we don't actually have the, um, the documents themselves, but it's either terrorists, suspected terrorists, Islamic radicals, insurgents, I've seen members of Al-Qaeda and its associates, Taliban, jihadists, Muslim extremists, unlawful enemy combatants, and I might add slightly facetiously the Bush administration locution of evildoer. None of these, with the possible exception of members of Al-Qaeda and its associates, has much legal consonance, nor are they particularly well-defined categories of individuals. Is a suspected terrorist a proper target? Is he or she a civilian, a combatant? Are they directly participating in hostilities? How? Who decides? The ICRC has issued guidelines that the UN report on extrajudicial killings has actually criticized because it includes individuals who may be included because of status and not conduct. But it's not clear the United States respects even the ICRC guidelines as, for example, it appears to permit the targeted killing of drug traffickers in some cases where the ICRC guidelines say they do not. How sure must we be of his or her membership and an active participation in Al-Qaeda before he or she can be placed on a kill list? How is it that the US government can now use lethal military force to kill citizens with no judicial process in a foreign country far from any active theater of war? In 2002, an American of Yemeni background, Derwish, was killed by a missile from an unmanned predator aircraft. Derwish was not the target of the attack, according to media reports, but the US position was that as an enemy combatant, he had no constitutional rights. Nonetheless, it was shocking to many and the killing was widely reported in the U.S. media and denounced. Fewer than 10 years later, the government has gone from accidentally killing U.S. citizens to targeting them with very little public explanation or justification. The kill list targets specific individuals, not just soldiers on a battlefield who may have some statistical chance of survival, and of course no surrender is possible once a targeting decision has been taken. 
I don't have time to elaborate today on the process used by the executive branch to determine um, who and when to target human beings for death, but it can be summarized in two words, and I don't mean this facetiously, trust me. And they would add, we are very careful. I believe that actually a sincere effort to be careful is undertaken by US government officials, including the president himself. This is clear from both Holder and Brennan's remarks, as well as what we know of the president. Yet, in my view as an international lawyer, it's not consistent with the rule of law to make the lives of thousands of individuals depend solely on executive grace. To make the effectiveness of a procedural protection contingent upon the integrity of good faith of a specific individual or a particular set of individuals is inconsistent with the very notion of the rule of law, a point that I will come back to at the end. Finally, the purpose. The purpose of the strikes obviously depends on the theater in which they're being used. In Pakistan in 2009, it was reported that only six of the 41 CIA drone strikes conducted by the administration targeted Al-Qaeda to obtain the cooperation of Pakistan for the drone program, because their sovereignty obviously is at issue, Pakistani officials were permitted to nominate targets then taken out by US drone strikes, and 18 were directed uh, uh, to Taliban targets. So the question is, why? There are several possible theories, obviously. There's a specific deterrence argument. You're actually just killing terrorists or suspected terrorists, as we say, so they can engage in operations against the United States or its allies. There's general deterrence, demonstrating US ability to kill at great distances and thereby deterring other would-be terrorists. There's retribution, punishing those who have hurt the United States or threatened US interests, allies, or persons, or preventive or preemptive strikes to eliminate potential threats against the United States, US interests, allies, or persons, which sort of combines specific and general deterrence. Again, I can't explore all of these categories, but it's worth noting that several either violate principles of international humanitarian law, such as killing for retribution and preventive strikes, and others may do so as well. Given that experts have suggested that the number of high-value targets killed in Pakistan is as low in one in seven, and again, the numbers are all over the map, but that's at least one expert, one wonders whether the person is general deterrence or frightening the civilian population in areas of alleged terrorist activity to prevent civilians from possibly assisting alleged terrorists and disrupting their operations. Yet terrorizing a civilian population uh, is unlawful as the ICTY and the Special Court for Sierra Leone have both had found. And to the extent that the United States is perceived, even if the intent isn't to terrorize, as carrying out reprisals for the 9-11 attacks against Pakistanis who may not have had anything to do with them, the drone campaign is more suggestive of collective punishment than the surgically precise targeting of particularly dangerous individuals, which is how we tend to justify it. A recent article by a Pakistani professor at Lahore University makes the additional point that while it may be admitted that Al-Qaeda has as its mission the carrying out of jihad against US forces and persons wherever possible, he believes that the Taliban, and other experts have said the same, have as their goal to regain power in Afghanistan and reinstitute their vision of a pure state. Thus the drone campaign at best appears over-inclusive targeting Taliban who are not fighting the global war on terror against the United States, but a local war for control of territory. I began this lecture with the idea that the rules of international humanitarian law may actually be insufficient to answer the fundamental question whether the US drone wars are a good idea. I've also tried to make the case that the legal framework within which we're operating, and I say we as an American citizen, we, is shaky especially outside of active war zones, resting upon assumptions about the conduct of war that are highly contested in the ac academy and internationally. I also deeply contest the bona fides of the third legal category of unlawful enemy combatant, which I believe to have been invented by the Bush administration some 11 years ago. At the same time, I have to admit it's been around a long time, 11 years, and further, it is certainly true that some limited number of the strikes are legal under more traditional notions of IHL than those the US government currently is employing. So the question remains, are they moral? Are they ethical? And do they represent US values, the values we believe showed the best in us and which were articulated at Nuremberg? As Whitney R. Harris wrote some years before his death, 
The rule of law of Nuremberg and of modern Rome, meaning the ICC statute, is universal, binding large states and small, victor and vanquished in any future war. The principle was most forcefully expressed by Mr. Justice Jackson when he declared that the international, international law condemned aggression by every nation, including those which sit now in judgment. This idea has recently been captured by Jeremy Waldron's work in requiring that norms be neutral in application and has particular salience for the use of drones as targeted killing of tactics of war. Although the United States may not have opened the Pandora's box of targeted killing, and indeed it did not originally, the U.S. conducts its targeted killing operation as if only states with good purposes, like us, will have access to or deploy these weapons. Waldron notes that if we defend as legal and appropriate a norm, and I quote, Named civilians may be targeted with deadly force if they are presently involved in planning terrorist atrocities or likely to be involved in carrying them out in the future. He calls this norm N1. Because international humanitarian law applies to all states alike, we must expect this norm N1 to be used by other states, including our enemies. Moreover, given the American disinclination to permit international or even domestic scrutiny of our targeted killing operations, we can't expect other countries to do much better, especially countries we might expect to use targeted killing and drones if they had them unscrupulously. The notion that the good guys get to use different rules than the bad guys has periodically surfaced in both moral analysis, Jeff McMahon is an example, and even at the International Criminal Tribunal, says I think Brenda referred to uh, either this morning or last night, recall the arguments made and initially accepted in the CDF case, that as opponents of the RUF, the CDF were operating under different rules. Yet those arguments have been overwhelmingly rejected by the nations of the world in the ICC statute. By its terms, Rome law applies to all nations, small or large, rich or poor, with one would say a possible escape hatch for the permanent members of the Security Council and countries under their protection. It is estimated now that nearly 50 other countries, including China, Russia, Pakistan, and Iran, possess drone technology. We seem to be giving them unintended incentives both to develop and to use these weapons. Finally, as Peter Singer recently noted, specific use of drones in, in war may not only violate IHL, but represent a technology that appears to remove the last political barrier to war. As he notes, the drone campaign involves hundreds of strikes and thousands of deaths, yet it has never been seriously debated or authorized by Congress, and it has spread to additional countries and additional campaigns. In Libya, nearly 150 American unmanned systems were deployed. When asked why there was no need to comply with the War Powers Resolution to obtain additional authorization for the use of force, the White House contended the operations did not, quote, involve the presence of U.S. ground troops, U.S. casualties, or a serious threat thereof. Singer provocatively notes that they did involve something else that we used to think of as war, though, which is blowing lots of stuff up. And I might add, they kill a lot of people. The drones are fired from thousands of miles away using technology resembling a video game, and after the killing is over, the drone operator can return home to a normal life, grabbing a bite to eat, hugging his or her kids, enjoying time with friends, just like we do. Some use of drones may be clearly legal under the principles of the law of war, but their misuse and overuse as counterterrorism tools, in my view, raise some serious moral and legal and ethical issues. The occasional or exceptional use of drone strikes to target very dangerous individuals that cannot be captured might be tolerable. I say might, I don't know. But the large-scale use of controversial weapons is, in my view, deeply problematic. In fact, what seems to have happened or seems to be happening is perhaps we're turning the exception into the rule. For several months, I've had a newspaper clipping on the corner of my desk about the death of a young man named Tariq Aziz, who was killed in Pakistan by a Hellfire missile strike launched by the United States. Tariq's story emerged from the shadows of the CIA's drone war only because he had encountered a lawyer, Clive Smith, at a meeting organized to discuss the drone strikes held between Westerners and Pashtun tribal leaders a few days before his death. Tariq was brought to the meeting to experience the interaction with Americans, and according to Smith, 
was friendly, open, and warm. He writes, too young for much facial hair, too young to have learned to hate. From his description, I could see my own son in his eyes. For some reason, he was targeted for death and killed by a Hellfire missile fired from a Predator drone while driving in a car with his 12-year-old cousin, who was obviously also killed. They were on the way to pick up their aunt and bring her home to a village. As Smith later wrote in the New York Times, he writes, my mistake had been to see the drone war in Waziristan in terms of abstract legal theory as a blatantly illegal invasion of Pakistani sovereignty akin to Richard Nixon's bombing of Cambodia in 1970. But now the issue has suddenly become very real and very personal. Tariq was a good kid and courageous. My warm hand recently touched his in friendship, yet within three days, his would be cold in death, the rigor mortis inflicted by my government. And Tariq's extended family, so recently hoping, he writes, to be our allies for peace, has now been ripped apart by an American missile, most likely making any effort at reconciliation futile. I end with this story to remind myself, maybe to remind all of us, that war and international humanitarian law are not just abstract legal and political concepts, but deeply personal realities for the human beings caught in their throes. Tariq's story could have been the story of our families had we been unlucky enough to have been born in a different time or a different place. In assessing the legality, the morality, and the policy considerations surrounding our targeting killing policy, that is a sobering thought. Just as we saw with the torture memos in the case of the Drone Wars, US lawyers have been forced to offer legal justifications for the killings carried out in far off countries. But these policies and the deaths that follow would not appear to make life much better in the countries on the receiving end of this punishing treatment although by all accounts they are apparently highly effective in killing suspected terrorists and disrupting their operations. What would Athena choose in this war? What wise counsel would she have offered those who have to make these very difficult decisions about what to do? I believe it would be policies that encourage the people of Afghanistan, the people of Pakistan, the people of Yemen, the people in countries as yet unnamed who do not yet know that one day their sleep may be disturbed by the buzzing of drones flying overhead, to choose peaceful relations with America and the rest of the world rather than policies that sow enmity and hatred. I believe she would have encouraged us and would encourage us today to choose the olive tree as her gift and her symbol to those people and that a gift such as this is more in line with the values that we cherish as Americans than the bitter taste and scorched earth left by the firing of a Hellfire missile. Thank you. of the evening, we have two potential options, or both, and I will explain one of those, and Greg Peterson will come forward and talk about another option that you can view this evening. Uh, we will again have some wine and porch, porch session this evening with some wine and beer that will be back in the room where it was last night and that you were all invited and we invite you all again. Uh, where's Michael? I'm not seeing him. Am I just not seeing him or is he hiding? Okay, well, anyway, there may be some guitar music somewhere with Michael again. And so that's very, very possible. So you just listen for that. Uh, tomorrow morning, again, breakfast will start at 7 a.m. in the morning with a breakfast address at 7.45. And so we very much look forward to that. 
And so we have the wine tonight, wine and beer, if you'd like to stay around and enjoy that. And Greg Peterson, I'll ask him to step forward and tell of another opportunity that we may have this evening. It's not May, we will. It's a quick story. This is 2003. I'm in Charlotte, South Carolina. I met with my wife and friends. My wife wants to go shopping. I want to go to a bookstore. I go to a bookstore. I find a book. It's entitled Nuremberg, The Trial of Major German War Criminals, Nuremberg, Germany, 1945-1946 by Robert Story. I open it up and it's autographed by Robert Story. I said, this is cool. Who's Robert Story? So I learned about this. But in reading the book on the way back, I noticed there was reference to the fact that he was gathering evidence. And part of the gathering of the evidence was film evidence. And part of the three people involved in gathering the film evidence was Bud Schulberg. Bud Schulberg of Let's uh, Run, Sammy Run, and uh, On the Waterfront. And he was part of the Nuremberg process. So John Barrett and I, dutifully tracked him down. Long story, we won't bore you with that. And we actually went to Long Island and sat there with, with Bud Schulberg, the Bud Schulberg Academy Award on the shelf. And we talked about his experience at Nuremberg, gathering film, film documents for the fact that it was ultimately presented at the Nuremberg trial, which you recall all remember. It was shown and Hermann Goering and the reaction of all the various defendants. Uh, as well as the movie which was the Nazi plan. Now, we prevailed upon Bud Schubert to come to the Jackson Center and for the very first time ever gave a presentation on the Nuremberg trial and his participation in January of 2004. Out of nowhere, out of nowhere, comes one Bud Schubert's niece, Sandra Schubert, and she comes and introduces herself, and she's there in the audience to watch Uncle Bud talk for the very first time, and a very emotional time, uh, about his involvement with the Nuremberg trial. That began a relationship with Sandra Schubert. And Sandra Schubert has since gone and taken the film, which her, her father, together with Uncle Bud, were involved in. And it's called Nuremberg, It's Lessons for Today. Now. Out of nowhere, tonight is Sandra Schubert. And we're so thrilled to have Sandra Schubert here that we could not let go the evening without one recognizer in all of the work she's done in restoring that film, which has received wonderful reviews, including the New York Times, Haunting and Vivid, The Washington Post, Mesmerizing. And she's circled the globe showing the movie Nuremberg. We have many students here today who've never seen that movie. Maybe some of you have never seen that movie. Through the wonderment of big screen television and the wonderment and the, that Sandra Schubert actually has her DVD with her, we're going to show that. We're going to show that tonight. And that same wine and beer that's available <laughs> to listen to the melodic tones of Michael Sharp will be also available to, to watch and enjoy Sandra Schubert. We're big time at the Robert Jackson Center. So uh, there will be, after we conclude here in just a few minutes, uh, Sandra, do you want to say something about this? She's, she's coming up as if she does. So let me introduce Sandra Schubert, uh, who's done a terrific job. by the wonderful Greg. I never, this wasn't planned. Uh, I certainly didn't expect to be following Layla. And uh, Layla, where are you sitting? There you are. I, I'm so grateful to you for articulating so beautifully what I'm sure many of us feel, this queasy, queasy feeling in the pit of our stomachs. Um, so, uh, at, at best, queasy feeling, at worst, a sense of juridical outrage. Um, so, uh, if you weren't sobered up by Layla's talk, this movie is really going to sober you up. <laughs> and those of you who'd rather just continue flowing down the river of wine or 
want to go back and have another stiff gin and tonic, are definitely uh, encouraged to do so. Uh, because the film that you're about to watch, if that's what you choose to do, is a very sober look at the first Nuremberg trial, which, uh, as some of you know, was made by my father for the War Department, uh, completed in 1948. And, uh, before we watch the film, I just want to thank Greg and Cindy Peterson. It's true, every word that Greg said. Uh, Bud was first spoke about his role at the trial here, and uh, that, uh, and as a result, I embarked on this long journey to restore the film. Uh, there are people here in this room who have joined me on the crusade, and I want to thank Don Ferenz and Stephen Rath and David Crane, David Shepard, Sharif Basayuni, and Judge Cowell, and Michael Sharp, who I guess is off tuning his guitar, uh, and John Barrett, and especially Anna Harris, because she and Whitney made the very first contribution to Restore Nuremberg. Uh, so that means a great deal to me. Uh, finally, I want to apologize to Judge Cowell and Ambassador Correll and any other Germans who are in the room because um, I feel very strongly that thanks in part to this film and the work of all the others who worked on denazification and re-education in Germany in the immediate aftermath of the war, that Germany really has learned the lessons of Nuremberg better than any other country in the world, including our own. And Judge Cowell represents that in the work that he does every day, and Germany represents that in its leadership in the world in terms of support for the ICC. So I think we have always a lot of catching up to do. So when you watch this film, I don't want you to, uh, you, you have to keep in mind that this is very much a film of its time. Uh, and that's what makes it important, historically important, but it needs to be deconstructed. It is the, the first film about the Nuremberg trial and the legacy of the trial, uh, but it has to be interpreted for today. And uh, finally, I also want to thank Bill Shabis, who's back there, who's, whose student I hope soon to become. Uh, but in a sense, I'm a student of all of yours. I've learned so much from getting to uh, spend time with you, especially here at the Humanitarian Law Dialogues. So now everyone who'd like to adjourn and drink should depart, and, and everyone who'd like to do the film is welcome. You're the best. <laughs> hey, everybody can adjourn and drink for 15 minutes, and then by that time you'll have made your choice. Michael Scharf, wherever he may be, if you can find him, or here, we'll create, what we're gonna do is we, we have a, a flat screen television and we'll create sort of an amphitheater effect here because I have an awful lot of students who have agreed that if we showed the movie, they would help us move some chairs around. So uh, we'll be uh, soliciting that help. With that, we stand adjourned, thank you.